born. He will discuss the birth of stars at radio and infrared wavelengths. The observations will show that stars go through various stages to become a young star. A particular interest will be the most massive stars that are difficult to understand. A byproduct of these observations will present evidence of for young solar systems and the process of solar formation. If you help me welcome Dr. Jim Jack. So today I was talking to um, a professor at BU, Professor Ken James. He's um, He's about 65 right now, and he tells me that he began his career in astronomy based on a skyscraper's um, incident. He used to live in Storrs, Connecticut, and he came to a um, skyscraper's function when he was 14, and he saw the Alvin Clark Telescope, and he decided that moment he wanted to be an astronomer. So mm -hmm. we thank you for bringing up Professor James. All right, so I'm going to talk to you today about how stars are born. This is um, research that's near and dear to my heart. I've been working on um, star formation for my entire astronomical career. Um, it's an interesting problem that's not yet solved. Yeah? Okay. So, um, I may not have to um, explain all this to you. You're probably pretty savvy about what's going on here, but one of the interesting questions that astronomers, or actually physicists, ask is what lies inside of the rainbow. You see a rainbow here. I'll stand over here. And of course, you know, it's the electromagnetic spectrum broken up. And um, visible light, which most of you study. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have many safe zones. All right, I'll just I'll, I'll, I'll speak more slowly. Um, um, it's only a small part of the um, electromagnetic spectrum. Light is a wave of electricity and magnetism, but it covers only a narrow, very narrow range of wavelengths. Um, and there are many other kinds of electromagnetic radiation, some with longer wavelengths, some with shorter than visible light. And you know, here's the visible light spectrum. Actually, I have a laser pointer now. This is so cool. Uh, oh, look at that. Mm. So here's the familiar rainbow, but on this end is the infrared and this end is the ultraviolet. And in fact, if you expand this range, you get um, even more range. Um, um, infrared goes into radio, and on the short wavelength side, you have ultraviolet, X-ray, and gamma ray. My research focuses on this range, which the human eye cannot see. But it's a good thing, because um, if everyone could see it, then it wouldn't be interesting. Everyone would have done it. So. We have to take your word for it. Right. So let me talk about the birth of stars. Um, how many of you here have seen the Rosette Nebula? All right. Beautiful nebula. This is a typical star forming region. This is what star forming regions look like. The red, of course, is hydrogen gas lit up by the, the cluster of stars in there. Um, this is not a particularly bright region. It's not a particularly faint region. It's kind of a you know, run of the mill star forming region. Uh, these regions are near and dear to my heart. And what we've learned about star formation actually only happened in the last 50 years. Star formation was um, a mystery until uh, recent research. Perhaps the, um, the origin of the study of star formation was, goes back to Herschel. Now Herschel, as you may know, was, a, uh, was in the Prussian army and he abandoned the Prussian army. He wasn't really a soldier, he was a musician. He played the oboe. And uh, when he left the Prussian army, no one in the Prussian army particularly cared whether he left, and he went to, to England. And but his, his skills as a musician and a, a maker of oboes translated very well into the making of intricate instruments like telescopes. The tubes that he used for oboe making can translate very directly to telescope making. And of course, he is one of the great observational astronomers of all time. When he was scanning the sky, particularly in the Milky Way, he found objects like this. And when he first saw them, he said, my God, there are holes in the sky. Well, his interpretation was this was a, a gap in the stars. It was a hole. But now we know, in fact, this is not a hole. This is a region of obscuration. The astronomers in the 1930s, 1940s began to understand that these obscuration zones actually correlate with the, the um, location of star clusters, of young star clusters. You know the stars are young because they're blue, 
Blue stars don't live very long. They can't travel very far from where they're born. And so you see here a beautiful association between a young cluster and this black spot, which Herschel interpreted as a hole. We now know it's not a hole, it's a cloud. It's a gas cloud that's filled with dust. And the dust leads to obscuration. It's a molecular cloud. And molecular clouds are found everywhere. They're ubiquitous throughout the galaxy. The galaxy is just chock full of these things. Sometimes they're lit by stars and you have these beautiful colors um, due to oxygen and sulfur and, and hydrogen. You see these wonderful, interesting filamentary structures. But um, they're, they're essentially everywhere. And for a galactic astronomer like me and a star formation astronomer like me, these, this is where the action is. The unfortunate thing about molecular clouds, though, is that they're absolutely opaque. The dust particles in molecular clouds are very similar to the dust, to the particles of cigarette smoke. It has about, about the same size, about the same opacity. So if you're looking at the Milky Way and the visible, these molecular clouds are actually dark, they're opaque, and you can't see through them. But this is where stars are born. So if you want to study them, you have to look at other wavelengths. Here's a picture of molecular clouds. This is the Milky Way galaxy. Um, in the radio, and you can see that in this image, exactly the same scale, you can now cut through this haze, the smoke, and peer through to the Milky Way. It looks much more disc-like in this picture, much flatter. And this is a truer rendition of what the Milky Way actually looks like. Most of these clouds that we see, the black clouds in the Milky Way, are actually quite local. They're nearby, so they appear bigger, they, they extend to higher latitudes. But um, the Milky Way is actually very flat, about the same aspect ratio as a, as a compact disk. So wow. it's extremely flat. Um, here's a picture in the infrared. This is taken from the IRS satellite. And again, you see this wonderfully flat disk. And this local fluff is actually due to the, the local planets. But the Milky Way is actually viewed in the, mil in the, inf in the infrared and the radio. So if you're going to study the star formation, you're going to study star formation in the Milky Way, you have to go to radio and infrared telescopes. So this is what I do. Um, it's wonderful. One of the telescopes that I use is a telescope in Massachusetts. Now, I know how you feel about Connecticut, but maybe you like Massachusetts a little better. Um, <laughs> this, is, um, this is a telescope that's operated by the University of Massachusetts, um, actually the Five College Radio Astronomy Consortium. Um, this is near the Coahuila Re Reservoir. It's a 15-meter telescope. It's inside this ray dome because Massachusetts is actually a very terrible place to do astronomy. Um, it's wet. It's low. It's um, the sky is opaque. It's not a really particularly good place. But nevertheless, um, there are many, many good days during the year where you can actually observe at millimeter wavelengths. This is a millimeter wave telescope, so somewhere between the infrared and the radio. Most astronomers consider this the radio. We actually operated this telescope remotely from Boston University um, over the internet, which saved us our two and a half hour drive to the, to the telescope each and every day. And we used this telescope for, oh, like three or four hundred nights. They kind of blur together. But we had a very large project specifically to map the Milky Way in these molecular clouds, to find out what the molecular clouds looked like in the Milky Way. So here's a sample of the picture we took. This is called the, um, the Galactic Ring Survey, which is something I spent eight years of my career doing. And what we're looking at is, um, here are molecular clouds throughout the Milky Way. So we're looking at, along the galactic plane, and we're looking at molecular gas. And we're, we're tracing that molecular gas in the light of carbon monoxide. There's a spectral line of carbon monoxide of 2.6 millimeters. Yeah, question? The whole sky right there? No. Very small, tiny fraction. There's the full moon. Oh, right. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. So um, we mapped about 40 degrees of sky in this in this survey. And we're in the sky. This is near the constellation of Aquila. It's in the galactic plane. That is it's as close to the galactic center as we can get, but still at sufficient elevation. Yeah, exactly. It's sufficient elevation. 